Okay, I think that's enough to get us started. Um, well, I know this is theoretically a diplomatic history class, um, but I've always been of the impression that unless you, unless you have some kind of a grasp of social and particularly economic history, you really cannot understand the larger trends. I mean, after all, the central theme of the modern world, or the central question is maybe a better way of putting it, why the West, what we began with the first week. There are so many answers to this question. We've already looked at many of them, cultural, financial, um, issues to do with politics, representative institutions, banking, credit, military revolution. Now, all of that helps explain to some extent why Napoleon was able to invade Egypt in 1798 and more or less have his way, um, ejected only mostly due to British intervention with, of course, some help from Jazar Pasha. It helps explain why Europe was able to colonize the Americas. You remember the Jared Diamond argument we began with about guns, germs, and steel, although it didn't understand why it was, it didn't explain why it was the Europeans as opposed to the Semitic peoples of the Near East, and the Islamic world, India or China. Um, still though, when we get up to about 1800, we can begin to see the outlines of Western or European dominance. But we haven't really seen the most dramatic development yet. I mean, after all, if you look at Napoleon's armies and how they fought, they fought the Mamluks. They won, right? Why did they win? We talked about it a little bit. Superior tactics, certainly, training. Uh, the squares, the discipline, the men being able to both obey orders and understand orders, feeling maybe like they were fighting, you know, not just for some distant warlord, but to a certain extent for a nation. Yeah, so maybe there were political factors. What about the weapons, though? They weren't really all that different. The Mamluks actually had more artillery than the French did. They had more cavalry than the French did. They were more mobile than the French were. Yeah, drill, tactics, training, all of that probably made the biggest difference. Some magic glue in Napoleon's leadership. Now, compare that to the picture in the late 19th century when Europe was carving up Africa with machine guns, with railroads that they're building with steam-powered ships, later coal-powered ships, later gasoline-powered ships. Or the First World War, when you have humongous armies being moved at least up to the front lines by rail. Or the Second World War, the internal combustion engine, the tank. You have a much more dramatic, even a geometric impact. I mean, some of the statistics, of course, statistics are always a little bit misleading and possibly vague. But if you have with you the Kennedy book, Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, or the photocopies, he has a chart on page 149, a very rough, crude approximation of manufacturing output, that is, share of basic production. Could be production of anything from foodstuffs to textiles, um, furniture, um, all of the stuff, basically, of human life. Manufacturing output, circa 1750. Europe as a whole has a little less than a quarter, about 23%. China actually has more, as you might expect. It has a much larger population, about 33%. The subcontinent, India, Pakistan, about a quarter. So that leaves most of the rest for the Islamic world, with just a tiny little bit for the Americas. You fast forward then 150 years later, Europe has 62%, almost a two-thirds share of world production. China has gone from a third, from 33% to 6%. India and Pakistan have gone from 25% to 2%. So you go from a quarter, if you're India-Pakistan, to a 50th. Or in the case of Europe, you go from a quarter to two-thirds. This is just in terms of share. If you look at raw economic output, there you're talking about a geometric increase in production. Literally geometric. It increases by leaps and bounds. Now, as to how it happened, why? I mean, this is really, this is the great mystery, again, the great question. Now, why did this happen in Europe? How did it happen? What did it mean? Eventually, yes, many of the techniques were later exported to other countries. 
But the miracle happened in only one place, and it really was a miracle. Again, Napoleon's armies, 1798, 1800, 1810. Yeah, they were impressive. He was kind of like a modern Alexander. But if you really looked at it, all that he had that Alexander didn't was, well, he had some artillery and some guns, which, again, the Islamic world had too. There was no great technological advance. His men had moved to Egypt basically by wind power, right? By, by sail, sailing ships, which were, yes, somewhat more sophisticated than the triremes of the ancient world. But essentially, aside from the wind, Napoleon and his army still required on brute force animal power and muscle power. The strength of his men, the strength of the pack animals and the horses which transported the goods. You remember we talked about how Napoleon's armies basically ran aground in Russia in part because they lost so many horses and because of the declining quality of the horses that they had. They lost like 200,000 horses. Completely lost mobility. Remember though that horses actually need to feed. They need to eat. So do people. And so in order to fuel an army, you might say, based on muscle power and animal power, you need fodder. You need food for the horses, food for the men. It's expensive. It's inherently limited. Now, as we all know, today, most armies don't rely on that at all. If they rely on anything, I suppose you could say it's refined gasoline, which is another way of saying that they don't require animal power at all. Yes, soldiers are expected to be fit, but that's not so much because they're expected to go into hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's just, it's basically a way of them keeping their cool under pressure. Yes, soldiers still do have to carry kit, but today's soldiers are of a completely different order than the soldiers of 200 years ago. I mean, you think about this, like, to, to, to kind of put it into more human terms, picture, if you will, a Volkswagen uh, Touareg. Funny name for, a, for an SUV. It weighs about four metric tons. That is about 8,000 kilos, 8,000 kilograms. Now picture, if you will, this car either being tugged by horses or more interestingly pushed by people. Maybe all of us got together and we tried to push this car. We tried to push it 10 kilometers. We would poop out pretty quickly. Now imagine this. Imagine we're not just pushing it. We're pushing it uphill. Okay, so you go down to the entrance to Bill Kent. And then imagine all of us trying to push a Volkswagen Tuareg up the hill. Imagine how quickly we would lose our energy, probably within about five or ten minutes. We would want to break. We would probably want to eat something. We would need to drink something. We would get really exhausted. Magically, the internal combustion engine does that work at a cost of what? Maybe... Uh, third of a liter of gasoline. It does the same work as probably all of us. We would take like a week or two to do it. And all that time we would be eating and consuming food. Now, I mean, how did it happen? It's kind of like magic if you really think about it. We take it for granted today. You know, we take automobiles and planes for granted. We take the internal, the internal combustion engine for granted. Uh, before that, the steam engine. Engines fired first by gasoline, then a little bit further back by coal, and then a little bit further back by steam. We take the production of clothing. I mean, clothing in some ways is really the essence of it. Like if you look at this, this incredible development where Europe and particularly the UK, you know, the UK goes from, and basically the UK and India sort of reverse positions. You know, the UK goes from 2% of world production to about 20 or 25. India goes from 25 to about 2. Now, of course, the kind of the Marxist critique or the pseudo-Marxist critique of the modern world is that that's all because of exploitation and colonialism. But it's not that India stopped producing necessarily. It's just that English production ramped up by two, three hundred, four hundred times, thousands and thousands of percent. It began, as most industrial booms usually do, with textiles. Uh, if you look at like the key inventions, there's the spinning jenny. Um, this was the use of water power in order to sew clothing through the use of large mechanical wombs, which was then improved by the steam engine, which allowed water power to be not just from rivers, but from 
heat, basically. If you heated water, the steam would then power the looms. Um, a little bit later, some of the improvements actually were more technical, like the cotton gin, uh, first invented by Eli Whitney. The spread of these mills in the United Kingdom, there are about 150 of them by the time of the French Revolution. There are thousands of them by the early 1800s. England is suddenly able to produce clothing, that is textiles, on an enormous scale and far cheaper than anyone else. That's what really happened to India. English textiles more or less destroyed the native clothing industry. Um, which is one of the reasons why, again, if you look at the kind of the cynical argument about it, the English, you know, they kind of almost inadvertently destroyed the Indian textile industry. Which isn't really what they wanted to do, because they were running India after all. And so what they did next was, they tried to figure out another thing for the Indians to produce. And they came up with opium which is why the English then fought a war against China to force the Chinese to consume Indian-produced opium. I mean, it's mostly, of course, from you know, Afghan what is now Afghanistan and Pakistan. You know, there are conspiracy theories about it. It wasn't like the whole thing was an intentional design. The English simply mastered all of this before anyone else. I mean, there were other elements, too. You know, you can look at it in terms of production, first with textiles, later on with everything that you needed to produce the machines. You have this add-on effect, right? First, you need the machines to produce the textiles, and then you need the materials for the machines, and so you need something like steel. You need metals, which then in turn produces a demand for a smelting industry, improvements in smelting leading to things like the Bessemer process, and then all of this, of course, in turn produces a demand for other things. Railroads, again, another classic example. Once they master the steam engine, and then later on the coal-powered engine, railroads then are able to, of course, improve communications, which stimulates trade. But it also stimulates whatever you need to produce the railroads themselves. In this case, of course, steel. You know, steel being really the magic ingredient in most 19th century industry. So anyway, this is the what. Okay, England masters first mechanical textile production. Then eventually England and even more so America, they master modern railroads. You also get communications, the invention of the telegraph. Uh, the laying of the first submarine cable, the transatlantic cable, the telephone. What's interesting about all of these things is that you think about how much they transformed lives. You know, there was a lot of hype about 10, 15 years ago about the Internet. You know, everything is going to be new. The Internet will change everything. Um, well, it changed a lot of things, sure. You know, we all got lazier because now all we do is we use Google and Wikipedia when we want to find anything out. We don't even go to the library, right? We just punch in a couple of clicks and we look it up online. I mean, even to prepare this lecture, if I wanted to remind myself about any of these things, I could just punch them in online, so long as I trust Wikipedia, which is not always something you want to do. But okay, so it's nice. It's kind of a convenience. But on the other hand, I mean, if you ever spend a week or two without the internet, if you ever go on vacation, it's not like your life is really impoverished, is it? I mean, I don't know, maybe you're addicted, like I am. Like, you go online, you check your news, you go onto Facebook, whatever. Yeah, it's addictive, it's, it's a part of our lives now. But take it away, and what would we do? We would just do other things. I mean, in some ways, it's just a leisure activity. Yes, it might improve things regarding something like scientific advances, which can now be propagated slightly more quickly. But if you really think about it, I mean, what is the internet? It's a bunch of cables laying underneath the ocean that allows you instantaneously to look at computers elsewhere in the world. Well, the first transatlantic cable was actually laid back in 1866. There's nothing new about that. The telephone, which is, again, pretty much what the internet is, right? It's almost the same thing. You use fiber optic cables. You know, what are we doing on Skype? We're talking on the telephone. The telephone was invented in 1876. Now, when the telephone was invented, now that was a dramatic, that was a dramatic shift in people's lifestyles, in communications. The real shift, in other words, happened during this era, this period roughly between, say, 1750 and 1850. That's when the world really changed. It changed both economically, but also, you know, in the end, of course, there were geopolitical implications, because by about 1860, um, England, this tiny little island, again, off the coast of Europe, has something like half of world steel production. Half. You know, you go back 500 years before that, and China was, of course, the world leader, as you would expect. 
in part because of technological sophistication, in part just because they had such a large population. In the case of England, it was kind of bizarre. I mean, it was extraordinary. England masters all of these techniques. They get, I mean, to some extent, it's good to be first. It can also sometimes not be good to be first. The telephone is an interesting example of this. Because America, for most of the 20th century, was the world leader in efficiency of communications. I mean, even you think about, like, Skype video phones. You know, the video phone was actually invented in the 1950s. Um, people actually didn't use it, or they didn't want to use it. I think in part because back then people were a little more modest, and they didn't want people seeing them, you know, half naked in their pajamas while they were talking on the phone. <laughs> no, I kid you not, they actually came out with a big model, AT&T, in 1960, and nobody wanted to use it. But anyway, America, because it was out front in the kind of the laying of all of these landlines, interestingly, America was very slow to adopt the cell phone. Um, you know, for the most part, even today, there are all these pockets in America where you can't get cell phone coverage. It's a little bit like that with England. They raced so far ahead by about 1850. They were just light years beyond anyone else in terms of the degree of industrialization, economic efficiency, gross output, you know, the relative gap between um, the British economy and the sophistication of British manufacturers and everyone else. But then they were, of course, later surpassed, famously by the Germans and by the Americans, and even to some extent by the French. And that's partly because some of the early advantages I think England had were later on not such advantages. You know, the very small size of the island meant that it was very easy to build and lay this rail network very quickly across England, much easier than it was in a place like Russia, which was much larger. But eventually, economies of scale would allow larger powers like America and Germany to surpass England, partly because they had, again, larger territory to draw on, larger internal markets, but also partly because they were able to essentially learn and copy from the English and improve upon the inventions that others made. The Japanese have been like this lately, you know, in the last 50 years or so. The Japanese haven't so much invented a lot of things as improved upon the inventions made by others because they were able to see what worked and what didn't. But anyway, back to England. Why? Again, this is the question. It's not just why Europe, it's why England? It's something economic historians are fascinated by. And they continue to pump out new arguments. You know, again, why industrialization? Why at this time? Why in this place? Um, you know, the cruder, more material versions of the argument, they'll tell you that basically it was because England had abundant coal resources. That um, they had run out of, like up in Scotland, they have peat, which is like a moss-like thing, something that you use to burn. But there's also wood, of course. You would burn trees. I mean, this is what you know, traditionally people did to warm themselves. Of course, in many parts of the world, people do still burn things like animal dung, you know, essentially horse manure or cattle manure. Um, it's not terribly efficient. It's also not terribly clean. It also doesn't smell terribly good. Um, although, supposedly, it smells better than coal, in, at least in some of its cruder, like sulfurous coal, of course, smells terrible. But anyway, so England, th the argument goes, they had cut down all their trees. Um, they had burned all of their peat. And so all that was left was coal. And they just kind of accidentally discovered how efficient coal was, because it burned so efficiently. Now, we all know, I mean, coal is not as efficient as oil, which is not as efficient as gasoline, which is not as efficient as highly refined gasoline. And of course, some people are discovering today that gasoline itself is less efficient than electricity, at least the types of things that draw on electricity. Uh, people are talking a lot about electric cars. Um, it's another interesting example where there's nothing new under the sun. The electric car was actually invented in the 19th century. It was invented over 100 years ago. It's just people haven't really been able to use it or exploit it because batteries are really heavy. So the problem is, this is why you, it's very difficult to imagine an electronic airplane. Because, of course, you'd have to put these humongous lithium-cadmium batteries in an airplane, and the whole thing would just like fall through the floor. Um, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult. Um, so some of it does have to do with materials. England definitely was well blessed with coal. If you have the other reading for this week, um, there's an interesting chart here on the Industrial Revolution. This is on page 195 uh, from the Crane-Brinton book. Um, 
it's an interesting map because it kind of shows you where the coal tended to be found in Europe, where iron ore deposits are located, where the prin principal manufacturing centers developed. And as you would guess, there's a lot of overlap. You know, where there were iron ore deposits, iron ore is, of course, what you need to make steel. Um, coal, which is what you use basically to burn, to power the machines and the smelters. They do tend to be clustered in certain areas. The kind of uh, key Benelux countries, you know, r right now modern kind of northwestern France, Belgium, the Ruhr area of Germany, uh, the Manchester area, Birmingham in England, southern England, London. These areas, yes, they do all have nearby resources. You know, so there's something to be said for that. But the, the thing about this argument, like all other arguments that depend on geography, materials, and luck, if you remember the jar di diamond argument about why Europe guns, germs, and steel, Again, it kind of breaks down when you realize that everything he says about the development of guns, germs, and steel applies just as well to the Middle East and North Africa and Asia, particularly Asia, as it does to Western Europe. In other words, it doesn't explain the smaller things inside the larger patterns. In the same way, if you were to guess here, if it really were all about available coal and iron deposits, you would expect that the Industrial Revolution probably would have first happened in you know, Western Germany or Belgium. And that's not where it happened. So I don't think that argument is sufficient. Now, economists, whether of the classical laissez-faire variety or you know, the Marxist variety, of course, they think that what really matters are things like um, property laws in institutions and traditions and even to some extent politics. And those arguments are interesting too. I put a couple of the bigger ones up on the board here. Um, this is a, the weirdest and my, my favorite of this. This is actually becoming almost like a vogue concept among economists these days. They talk about the Romeo and Juliet revolution. What does that mean? Um, essentially, it has something to do with capital formation and with habits. It's not just the formation of capital, but also, of course, the idea of savings. What does it mean? Well. Some of it has to do with the notion of equality and, and civil law, the notion of property rights, the notion of the individual. Um, it doesn't work in a society which is tribal. That is, everyone equal before the law, everyone essentially trusting other people in order to make economic arrangements with them. Um, I think it was usually attributed to an Afghan warrior, a Pashtun, you know, who said, um, you know, I against my brother, my brother and I against our cousin, my cousin and I against, you know, the other tribe, the other tribe and I against the world. You know, it all comes down to where your loyalties are. Um, there's an interesting concept, again, mixing together anthropology and economics, the notion of consanguinity. Um, and this definitely explains something about Europe in particular, but more especially England. If you look at a contrast to a place like modern Lebanon or modern Iraq, Places that are famously tribal in terms of the loyalties of the people, you know, where people belong to a certain clan. They tend to have a lot of cousin marriage. You marry your cousins. You're encouraged to do this, and in fact, in many cases, you have no choice. This is not a recipe for creating a modern impersonal state with trust in law and legal institutions. What it leads to instead is, again, Tri tribal loyalty and clanism. England, and in fact the entire Christian world, this is again one of those mysterious little things that has to do with, I think, um, social nature and particularly economic life. Christianity has a very strict prohibition on consanguinity. It's not just that you can't marry, obviously, your brother and your sister. Almost everyone agrees on that. You also can't marry your first cousin. You can't marry your second cousin or your third cousin or even your fourth cousin. Marriage, in other words, is not a kind of arranged family business. I mean, there isn't, sometimes it's called the Romeo and Juliet revolution. It's a bit exaggerated, but the notion that people choose their own partners, what this eventually leads to is the nuclear family. Now, the critique of this, of course, I mean, it's interesting coming from a country like America and from a background which is mostly Northern European. 
you know, if you compare it even to like the, the southern Europeans, the Latins were famously cold. You know, we don't have these like tearful, joyful family reunions where everyone gets together and, you know, makes a lot of noise and drinks a lot like the Greeks or the Italians. You know, my big fat Greek wedding kind of stuff. You know, the drawback is we don't have extended families. Or we don't tend to have extended families. That is with... No, I have 32 cousins, as I think the woman says in my big fat Greek wedding. Some of these arguments, as you can see, are not so much general to the Christian world as they are general to a particular part of the Christian world, specifically Northern Europe, and even more so England. Because all of these trends, again, first you have Christianity with its ban on cousin marriage, but then you also have, when you go further north in Europe, you get Protestant Europe. And this is, there's a whole thesis. It's associated mostly with the German sociologist Max Weber. And what he was talking about is this notion of Protestantism, the notion of the elect. Um, again, I always found the idea a little illogical of Calvinism. Predestination, we're all predestined either for heaven or for hell. What it supposedly means is that what we do on earth shows through an outer sign whether we're of the elect or not. And so everyone has a very strict obligation, or they think they do, to behave a certain way. Which doesn't really make sense if you think about it logically. And the Max Weber thesis breaks down when you notice that a lot of Catholic areas of Europe actually have prospered just as much in the modern world. It explains something, though. I don't know how much it explains, but it does explain something. Because if you look at the Protestant world, and then particularly if you look at England, England is really where the modern nuclear family first developed. Now, the thing that was particular about the English, it wasn't just that you had your quote-unquote romantic marriage, that is, a marriage between a man and a woman like Romeo and Juliet, who almost defied their families. That is, it has nothing to do with clan loyalty. It's just the man and the woman. Eventually, you had particularly late marriage. This is something that people have always noticed about Anglo-Saxon marriage patterns. I mean, even today, although it's more extreme today, where some people don't marry until they're you know, 35 or 40. Um, late marriage, what this basically meant was that the men would actually wait until they had enough property to marry. And all of this sort of feeds together with these notions, again, of on the one hand, you have no loyalty to a larger tribe, and so you are able to be loyal just to the state. It's kind of the glue of you know, modern atomistic individualism, but also patriotism. The other thing here, though, that, that is important about late marriage is this notion of saving, right? You have to have savings. And this is where even the Marxists would agree, although they would put a different line on it. They would say that ultimately what matters was capital formation. That is, saving your money, whether it is to save up for a late marriage, to support your family, or whether it is this Protestant notion, again, where you're supposed to behave a certain way. You're not supposed to spend your money. Now, this is very interesting if you compare it to other certain patterns that I think tend to be particularly true of these clannish societies in the Middle East, um, where the whole notion when you're the head of a great clan is that you're supposed to be generous to everyone. Some, some economists even call this the big man problem. It's even more true in Africa, where basically if you happen to be the one in your clan who has, let's say, like a government office, then you basically have to support all these cousins, right? You're supposed to pay for everybody. You have these kind of familial, tribal, clan obligations to support an enormous extended family and support them in style. You're supposed to buy lots of gifts all the time. You're supposed to entertain lavishly. In other words, if you have money, you spend it. This idea, whatever you call it again, late marriage, savings, capital formation, the Protestant ethic, there are a lot of different ways of describing it, but ultimately it gets down to the same basic thing. People behaving in what you might say is almost like an unnatural way. People who are willing to work long hours. People who are willing to deny themselves pleasures. People who are willing to think about the future and not the present. I mean, in some ways, this is describing a world that no longer exists, but it did exist 200 years ago. So that all of this stuff played some sort of a role in the development of this modern industrial capitalism in England. There is more to it than that, though. I think the most important institutional phenomenon that I want to mention it's very little understood, I don't think, outside the Anglo-Saxon world. Again, it sounds like a really boring subject. 
It's the notion of patent law. Patent law. You notice all these inventions, the spinning jenny, the steam engine, uh, the cotton gin, interchangeable parts, again Eli Whitney. Um, later on you had, in America, you had uh, Alexander Graham Bell who invents the telephone, uh, Thomas Edison who in some ways invents many varieties of modern electricity, uh, most famously the light bulb. Uh, this is Thomas Edison. My own personal favorite because he's kind of the patron saint of my hometown, Rochester, New York, Max, uh, sorry, George Eastman, uh, founder of Eastman Kodak, Kodak, modern photography. Um, it's an interesting thing about all these people. They're almost all either English or Americans. Although, if you actually listen to critics, Edison himself was not the real genius. Uh, it was an Italian called Marconi who actually invented most of the stuff. Edison just took credit. Well, this in itself, again, you remember how I talked about these accidents. You know, it can't just be that there's a lot of iron ore, because there are other places that have iron ore. It can't just be Christianity, because, after all, the Christian world is much larger than England. It can't just be late marriage patterns, because that was true in Scandinavia, too. If you want to figure out why it happened in England, I think ultimately it comes down to patent law. The statute of monopolies first passed in 1624 set down what would later on become a very important tradition, a legal tradition in the Anglo-Saxon world, the notion that patents can be registered. Now, it's true they have limitations. What is a patent? Patent basically means that you, your name, or the corporation which you might have organized has a legal monopoly on a product that you invented which lasts for a particular duration. Now, in modern terms, as we all know, things like pharmaceuticals, like Viagra, of course, Viagra, they came up with Viagra, and then a couple years later, now there are all these other, like Levitra and these other Viagra substitutes. Uh, that's partly because, depending on the industry, the statute of limitations on the monopoly is either, you know, of longer or shorter duration. But ultimately, if you think about this again, it sounds like a really boring subject, but it's not that the English were cleverer. I mean, like, if you look at things like, um, you know, modern test scores, you know, famously, the English don't do as well as, you know, like the Germans or the Japanese or other people when it comes to, like, scientific knowledge. The Chinese and the Japanese, by most standards, of course, you know, are kind of just as hardworking and, you know, pop possibly even more intelligent than a lot of the Western Europeans. But they didn't invent all this stuff. Now, who and why invented all of these things which basically created the modern industrialized world? Well, again, the people who did these things, you know, they tended to be tinkerers. Sometimes, like Edison, it wasn't even Edison himself who did the work. He had a whole team of people working for him. But the fact is, he could spend years of his life and a lot of his own hard-earned capital, or maybe even capital he borrowed from someone else, studying and experimenting with these processes because of the profit motive, because of the patent law which would allow him to profit from his invention. Again, wealth not coming from land, not coming from your inherited title, not coming from your position in a bureaucracy, but coming from essentially a kind of scientific entrepreneurial spirit, which is itself only possible because the laws exist to allow you to profit. Um, economists sometimes like talking about, it's ironic that they use this phrase, animal spirits, because of course the whole essence of the modern economy is to get away from animal and muscle power and to, you know, industrialize everything and eventually digitize everything. But this notion of animal spirits, this notion that, you know, people will pursue profit, I mean, this is kind of what Adam Smith was getting at in The Wealth of Nations. And when he talked about, you know, the self-interest of the butcher, right? That it's not that we are virtuous or altruistic, you know, that makes us good and that makes us valuable. Rather, it's that we pursue our self-interest. Now, of course, the economists and later the Marxists and the utopians and the other critiques of the early laissez-faire economists would say, well, not everyone can pursue their self-interest because eventually you're going to get you know, the rich exploiting the poor and so on. And you know, all of those arguments have a certain validity to them. But the fact remains that none of this stuff would have gotten going in the first place if it wasn't for essentially this profit motive leading these inventors to spend years of their life working on something. You know, so that even today, um, you have this whole phenomenon of venture capital, you know, in the Western world. 
again, you're sort of, uh, it's a bit like betting on horses, but instead you're betting on, you know, scientists and tinkerers. You know, the people who sponsored Google, you know, the people who sponsored Yahoo and the internet search engines, or before them, the people, or even after them, the people who were sponsoring biotech companies. You know, ultimately it is this mysterious notion of kind of profit seeking and self interest which underlies all of this. But it seems only to work. I mean, the thing is, you have to have other conditions there. You have to have the laws, not just the patent law, but you also have to have property law. You have to have the inviolability of person and property. You know, some of the things that are encompassed in, for example, the American Bill of Rights, you know, this notion that our persons and our properties cannot be subject to government seizure. You know, that the government cannot enter my house without probable cause. It cannot take my, say, car without probable cause. You have to have the legal framework to make all of this possible. I think you probably also have to have a certain predictability. There are these interesting arguments that are percolating around today, uh, particularly in American universities. Um, you hear a lot about this phrase, diversity. Diversity. This is the... Uh, this is like one of the key, it might almost be going out of fashion now. I haven't been in America that much in the last five years, but when I was in school, this was a big catchword. Diversity, which supposedly meant, you know, kind of a racial, cultural diversity that supposedly if, if you throw a lot of people from different backgrounds together, you know, something good will result. They don't explain exactly what. You know, tolerance, understanding, sophistication, who knows. What's interesting, though, is that the few academics, particularly sociologists and economists who have studied this, they've actually concluded the opposite. <laughs> that what happens in a place like modern Los Angeles, where you throw hundreds of different groups together, they end up not trusting each other, and not working together, and not talking to each other. And they don't put in the time and the investment required to create things like, say, Google. Instead it, instead, it seems to come when you have people of a certain culture who actually trust one another. I mean, you think about everything that underlies the modern economy. Like when you put your money in the bank. You remember, people didn't used to trust banks. Now, for very good reason, because banks would often go out of business. Banks would often fail. When you write a check to someone, well, I guess in this country, most things are done now with credit cards, um, you have to trust First of all, they have to trust that you're actually going to pay them. And they have to trust that the documents you're giving them are legit and are legal. When you buy something or put your money in the bank, you have to trust the bank is not going to steal your money or you know, invest it in something which might end up forcing that bank to fail. You have to trust, in other words, strangers. You have to trust people you don't know, which is a lot easier if you have something in common with them. You know, maybe it's like a common language. Um, well, anyway, so when you break it all down, you have a whole bunch of factors working together, some of them reinforcing other qualities. Some of it, yes, was material, abundant iron and coal deposits. Some of it was the ingenuity of these people made, it, again, possible by uh, the kind of legal tradition of the Anglo-Saxon world allowing you know, pact law and these inventions to develop. But when you add it all up, you got this massive expansion in wealth and potentially power, first in England and then once these things spread to America and to Western Europe, Western Europe and America, where by around the time of, let's say, 1900, it's as if they've entered a new universe and the rest of the world stands behind. They're just not living in the same you know, area. Um, population is, in fact, I think maybe one of the more interesting factors. Um, because we've already talked about how England's population, England's population goes up from about 9 million to 42 million. This is in the course of uh, the 19th century. Russia's population also, Russia's population goes from like 36 million to 125 million. Population multiplies by a factor of about four in most European countries. Now, traditionally, you didn't want overpopulation. But here, it's not just that you have more people, but they're actually wealthier than they were 100 years before. And so they're able to field larger armies. They're also able to feed them. Um, they're able to send their people around the world. In fact, one of the reasons for colonization and, and imperialism, you know, we'll get to that in a later week, was simply this 
demographic energy that was kind of seeking an outlet. A another factor was actually wages. Because with this many people, eventually, if you have too many workers, wages will go down. And so a lot of people left, you know, partly because the wages were low and partly to keep the wages from going lower. And eventually you had Europeans, particularly the English, settling places like Australia and Canada and, of course, America and all the rest of the world. Eventually what you got was a world that was Western, a world that followed these institutions and traditions, but a world which was also literally settled by Westerners who actually spread all these ideas. And you might say, which eventually paved the way for the West's decline, because once, of course, the rest of the world was able to catch up, then the rest of the world's population and potentially its power eventually surpassed Europe. But at least for about 100 years or so, the British and the Europeans had this, you might call it almost a monopoly on power and a monopoly on a power that was now geometrically larger than before. We're probably, I think, through the first hour about, is it? Yeah, okay. Well, let's take a short break. When we get back, I want to look at some of the debates about all of this, particularly the rise of liberalism and socialism and then eventually Marxism. Islamic world with just a tiny little bit for the Americas. You fast forward then 150 years later, Europe has 62%, almost a two-thirds share of world production. China has gone from a third, from 33%, to 6%. India and Pakistan have gone from 25% to 2%. So you go from a quarter, if you're India-Pakistan, to a 50th. Or in the case of Europe, you go from a quarter to two-thirds. This is just in terms of share. If you look at raw economic output, there you're talking about a geometric increase in production. Literally geometric. It increases by leaps and bounds. Now, as to how it happened, why? I mean, this is really, this is the great mystery, again, the great question. Now, why did this happen in Europe? How did it happen? What did it mean? Eventually, yes, many of the techniques were later exported to other countries. But the miracle happened in only one place, and it really was a miracle. Again, Napoleon's armies, 1798, 1800, 1810. Yeah, they were impressive. He was kind of like a modern Alexander. But if you really looked at it, all that he had that Alexander didn't was, well, he had some artillery and some guns, which, again, the Islamic world had too. There was no great technological advance. His men had moved to Egypt basically by wind power, right? By, by sail, sailing ships, which were, yes, somewhat more sophisticated than the triremes of the ancient world. But essentially, aside from the wind, Napoleon and his army still required on brute force animal power and muscle power. The strength of his men, the strength of the pack animals and the horses which transported the goods. You remember we talked about how Napoleon's armies basically ran aground in Russia in part because they lost so many horses and because of the declining quality of the horses that they had. They lost like 200,000 horses. Completely lost mobility. Remember though that horses actually need to feed. They need to eat. So do people. And so in order to fuel an army, you might say, based on muscle power and animal power, you need fodder. You need food for the horses, food for the men. It's expensive. It's inherently limited. Now, as we all know, today, most armies don't rely on that at all. If they rely on anything, I suppose you could say it's refined gasoline, which is another way of saying that they don't require animal power at all. Yes, soldiers are expected to be fifth railroads that they're building with steam-powered ships, later coal-powered ships, later gasoline-powered ships. Or the First World War, when you have humongous armies being moved at least up to the front lines by rail. Or the Second World War, the internal combustion engine, the tank. You have a much more dramatic, even a geometric impact. I mean, some of the statistics, of course, statistics are always a little bit misleading and possibly vague. But if you have with you the Kennedy book, Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, or the photocopies, he has a chart on page 149, a very rough, crude approximation of manufacturing output, that is, share of basic production. Could be production of anything from foodstuffs to textiles, 
um, furniture, um, all of the stuff basically of human life. Manufacturing output circa 1750. Europe as a whole has a little less than a quarter, about 23%. China actually has more, as you might expect. It has a much larger population, about 33%. The subcontinent, India, Pakistan, about a quarter. So that leaves most of the rest for the as opposed to the Semitic peoples of the Near East, and the Islamic world, India or China. Um, Still, though, when we get up to about 1800, we can begin to see the outlines of Western or European dominance. But we haven't really seen the most dramatic development yet. I mean, after all, if you look at Napoleon's armies and how they fought, they fought the Mamluks. They won, right? Why did they win? We talked about it a little bit. Superior tactics, certainly, training. Uh, the squares, the discipline, the men being able to both obey orders and understand orders, feeling maybe like they were fighting, you know, not just for some distant warlord, but to a certain extent for a nation. Yeah, so maybe there were political factors. What about the weapons, though? They weren't really all that different. The Mamluks actually had more artillery than the French did. They had more cavalry than the French did. They were more mobile than the French were. Yeah, drill, tactics, training, all of that probably made the biggest difference. Some magic glue in Napoleon's leadership. Now, compare that to the picture in the late 19th century when Europe was carving up Africa with machine guns. Okay, I think that's enough to get us started. Um, well, I know this is theoretically a diplomatic history class, um, but I've always been of the impression that unless you, unless you have some kind of a grasp of social and particularly economic history, you really cannot understand the larger trends. I mean, after all, the central theme of the modern world, or the central question is maybe a better way of putting it, why the West, what we began with the first week, there are so many answers to this question. We've already looked at many of them, cultural, financial um, issues to do with politics, representative institutions, banking, credit, military revolution. Now, all of that helps explain to some extent why Napoleon was able to invade Egypt in 1798 and more or less have his way. Um, ejected only mostly due to British intervention with of course, some help from Jazar Pasha. It helps explain why Europe was able to colonize the Americas. You remember the Jared Diamond argument we began with about guns, germs, and steel. Although it didn't understand why it was, it didn't explain why it was the Europeans 